Welcome. Well, you're at home with Jim and Joy, and you are an important part of our EWTN family, and we are delighted that you've welcomed us into your home. We would love to hear from you. So give us an email with your question or your comment to jimandjoy at EWTN.com and check us out on Facebook. So, so the question for today's show is, how did Pope St. John Paul II influence you personally and what are some of his lasting accomplishments mm, yes. great question because tomorrow is his feast day That's right. october 22nd yeah. and we're excited and the beautiful thing for, for me about pope john paul you know i was um pr i'm a convert right. so during his pontificate you know he took the world stage he didn't and you and as a protestant uh, you knew his presence in the world, and so it, it, you and you felt like, as a, an Episcopal per, as Episcopal priest's wife, I was there, and you'd see him. But yet you felt, I felt, like I belonged to him. He was he was there, and he belonged to the world, and you really had a sense that he was a, a holy man, in total surrender to God. And, and he was um, prayerful, he was intimate with Jesus, and his smile was contagious. He had a joy that was deep in his soul, and it emanated in his facial expressions. He was alive, and um, he taught us how to live and he taught us how to die. And so there were so many, so many wonderful things we could say about him, but those are just some yeah. from my simple and self. Hopefully we're <laughs> gonna hear from you. And uh, so just email us, let us know how John Paul II touched you personally. That's a lot of what you were sharing about, what you feel his accomplishments were. And there's so many, as you said, Joy, in various areas for me, especially Evangelium Vitae the gospel of life at that time when he was sharing his pontificate, 1978 to 2005, I believe that was the time. And uh, the whole pro-life issue was really very mm -hmm. front and center at that time. And he just articulated so beautifully um, the sanctity and dignity of every human being from the very moment of conception through natural death, no compromise. Mm. Every life is precious, inviolable. You cannot take innocent human life at whatever stage it might be. And all the other works of justice and mercy that we do are all illusory if you're not taking care of the least, mm -hmm. which is the pre-born child, the offspring of that mother. And so that was just one of his encyclicals. And so maybe you have some that stand out for you, maybe his teaching on theology of the body. Uh, so we're gonna be speaking about these things throughout the day and we want you to participate. We ask for the prayers of St. John Paul mm -hmm. uh, II throughout this show. And for you, his feast day again is tomorrow. Yes. And he's just a beautiful person uh, to pray to. And he is alive and he is well and he is interceding for his church and for all people. We'll be right back. There's plenty more to come. Please don't go away. Welcome back. Well, you can email your questions today to jimandjoy at ewtn.com and check us out on Facebook. So the question is this for today's show. How did Pope St. <laughs> John Paul II influence you personally and what are some of his lasting accomplishments? You know, I was sharing in the opening just about how he took the world stage and even how he met with President Reagan and the both of them one of the things they shared in common was they both survived assassination attempts on their lives. <clears throat> yeah. And you, you know, you, you really believed that both of them were called for a time such as this. And then just how influential both of them were in Poland. And you know, the famous quote where, you know, Ronald Reagan stands up and German. says, and you know, tear down this wall yeah. and so beautiful. And you, um, behind the scenes, 
the, the prayer participation that Pope John Paul had in that. And, and then the people and the whole labor movement and just how it rose up. And it was really, it was a, a world yeah. event for us all to see. And, you know, we got to go to Rome as Protestants and because God had us on a journey and um, and we got to see the Pope twice, like three, three times. times. We had an audit. We were in a, the Wednesday audience with him. We saw him on uh, the Spanish steps when he d um, yeah. did that beautiful thing on that Sunday night. Yes. And then another time just in the crowd. It was j <clears throat> and, you know, I'm a convert. And there I was. And I felt I believed that he belonged to me and that I belonged to him. And, and that's who he was because he, he was a, a visible witness of Jesus, right? I mean, that's who the Pope should be. And he was that and he lived that before our eyes and he drew you in. And as you were on the journey, yeah. you were closer than I and you had said to me, hon, I want to come in under Pope John Paul. You wanted to be a son of his. That's you wanted right. to come in while he was still reigning as Pope. Yes. And you did. And, and it did. was beautiful. And I followed suit. Uh, more information, EWTN.com forward slash John Paul 2, right? Yeah. Okay. EWTN.com forward slash John Paul 2. Go there, plenty of information understand more fully the greatness of this man, his life, his time, his works. Um, his growing up in the midst of Nazism mm -hmm. and communism, the losing of his brother's death, his mother's death, and then his father's death, and just being all alone. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was like his family mm -hmm. had gone. And his training as a seminarian, you know, in a clandestine fashion, mm -hmm. underground seminary. So he grew up with this domination and cruelty of Nazism and communism. He said that his relationship with his father was a very godly man, man of prayer, prayed various times during the evening. I believe they went to mass daily. And I think John Paul II served there mm -hmm. you know, at, at the mass. He said that <clears throat> my relationship with my father, I believe he said it, was my first seminary. Mm -hmm. Dads, can, can your children say that about you? My first seminary was my relationship with my father mm -hmm. and the model that he was. There's no substitute for a man, a godly man, going before the Lord upon his knees praying and, and leading his sons, his daughters, you know, to mass, to the church. Uh, so th th that's a great witness mm -hmm. in, and of, in and of itself. And, and I think that um, his, his teachings on the incarnation that Jesus is God with skin, God made poor, God in the flesh. Um, the sanctity of the human body, the sacredness of that. We know that in his teaching of the theology of the body, his teachings at the beginning of his pontificate, I don't even think they were titled Theology mm -hmm. of the Body. Mm -hmm. They were just teachings on, on the sacredness of the body and God making himself known through the body. His whole focus on man as body and soul mm -hmm. and, and spirit and that God's face was revealed in Jesus, and now God is moving theologically, this was a new way of teaching, mm -hmm. through the human body. That God is conveying himself. God is doing his theology in the midst of history through man and through woman. Yes, and boy, uh, what, what a prophetic word all that teaching was, right? Right, mm -hmm. which is what I was mm -hmm. gonna get to, because all of his, his teachings, his teaching before he was Pope, love and responsibility, mm -hmm. which we use a lot at our Crisis Pregnancy Center, the, the one quote that we use a lot with the women that are coming mm -hmm. in who are being used in incredible ways, how many sexually transmitted diseases, how many abortions, and, and this, you know, we say to them, hey, you're being used. Mm -hmm. You know, the opposite of Hate, love. opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is usury. Mm -hmm. And like their eyes are open. I, I, I'm being used. Mm -hmm. And this is such a denigrating thing for the human person. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess almost blasphemous, if, if it isn't, against, against the Lord who's in our bodies. So his teaching on man, on woman, mm -hmm. on the sanctity of marriage, and that the complementarity of man and woman how prophetic, like you're saying, yeah. is this for this time where the attacks upon marriage, the, the reinterpretation of reality mm -hmm. in marriage, you can reinterpret what marriage is. 
but you can't reinterpret reality, mm -hmm. the natural law, and man made for woman, woman made for man, and they're bringing forth children. Mm -hmm. Men and men can't do that, women and women can't do that. What can man and woman do together that they can't do separately? Right. And that's to procreate, to bring forth human life, to continue this species in the world, and to create more people who are doing the theology of the body. Yes. Everywhere you go, your face, what you're doing, you're revealing the love of Jesus Christ for his church, the love of Christ for the Father, the Father for the Son, them for the Holy Spirit, that the Trinity is a family. Mm. The Trinity is a family. That really helped me to understand the Trinity, which I could never understand. I still don't understand it totally. But to think of them as a family, and John Paul saying, that's what men and women do. Yes. That, that you create by God's grace, if you can bring forth a child, a family to model that Holy Trinity. Well, and he also wrote a beautiful encyclical on suffering. And you know, what he did, you know, we had come into the church when the first sexual scandal had hit. Mm. And here you saw this beautiful witness of this holy man, holy man, who loved our Lord, loved our lady, loved adoration, I mean, loved the Eucharist and brought all of that so alive before us. And then yet how he had to suffer and bear that. I mean, I mean, what pain? We, we have no idea the pain that he had to walk through yeah. as uh, he had to take up that cross. Yeah. And then just his, um, his physical suffering that he went through in his body, in, in his dying, in his body breaking down. With, with being shot with yeah. Parkinson's and so on. Yeah. Right, and, and dying and suffering right before our eyes. Mm with strokes, yet he still came out and he yeah. read and he prayed and he showed us how to die, showed us how to live and, and to do that in great faith and to yeah. do that in great hope. It was just such a beautiful witness, especially in this culture now as we have this, you know, uh, physician assisted suicide, you have a little pain, you got a bump, you got, you're not happy anymore, euthanasia, you, you, yeah. euthanasia you, you could just check out. Yeah. No, he finished to the end and he took up his cross and he followed him until his dying breath. And yeah. what a beautiful witness. And he set off his pontificate with what words? What words did John Paul say when he was up there in the window and the crowd was there in the piazza? He said, do not be afraid. Mm -hmm. Do not be afraid. And wow, I mean, mm -hmm. in the midst of all the fear in this world and, and so on, do not be afraid. Why? Because death does not have the final word. Death has no victory. Praise be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so he was the model of mm -hmm. Christ, the model of the victory. Yes, in this world you will have tribulation. Don't be afraid, for I have overcome this world. And that mm -hmm. was his hallmark, and then he lived, he lived that through. Right. You know, with, with sickness and suffering and violence and assassination and, and his body breaking down, as mm -hmm. you said. But he was saying, in the midst of all this, and he's telling us not to be afraid, because we do get afraid. Mm -hmm. But, you know, God will give us the courage that overcomes fear and he'll give us the hope. Yes. He was an apostle of, of hope. Faith is the assurance of things you're hoping for. It's the conviction of things not seen. And he had the hope mm -hmm. of everlasting life, of eternal life, and that he would be face to face with the incarnate Lord, that the incarnation, that, that Jesus would be taken up into heaven. And you're not just going to see a spirit. You're going to see Jesus Christ mm -hmm. with, with his wounds healed. You will be face to face. Do you believe this? Mm. We will be fa he, he believed that. John Paul too. Pray for us that we would believe that we will see you and our loved ones face to face. We want to finish this race and we want to continue to repent all the days of our lives that we might see the face of the Lord. Is there a quote here? We have a quote. It says, we are facing an enormous and dramatic clash between good and evil, death and life, the culture of death and the culture of life. And we find ourselves not only faced with, but necessarily in the midst of this conflict. We are all involved and we all share in it with the inescapable responsibility of choosing to be unconditionally 
pro-life. And this is from Evangelium Vitae. The gospel I of mean, life, yeah. that is prophetic. That was a time where we as a people of God, I quote those words yes. because I we battle the <laughs> culture of death every single day in this culture. And all the lies, the tsunami of lies in this culture of death that we as a people of life and a people of hope, we have to believe with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. I wanted to share a, a quote just quickly that was in the Magnificat. Speaking of all the great work he did with young people who loved him so dearly, he said this, it is Jesus that you are seeking, young people. When you dream of happiness, you're seeking Jesus. He's waiting for you. When nothing else you find satisfies you, he is the beauty to which you are so attracted. It is he who reads in your hearts your most genuine choices, the choices that others try to stifle. Young mm. people, come to Christ. He's the answer. We'll be right back. Plenty more to come. Please don't go away. Welcome back. Well, before we wrap up today's show, we're going to hear from Joan Lewis in Rome about the incredible impact of Pope St. John Paul II on her own life. Joan? Well, greetings, Jim and Joy. Oh, my word. What a topic today. How did John Paul II, a saint, personally affect my life, and what were some of his lasting achievements? Well, to be honest, I could talk through breakfast, lunch, and dinner about John Paul and the many years at the Vatican that I worked covering his, his papacy. I was in his presence probably 18, 19, 20 times, up close and personal, and several of those allowed for brief conversations. But one thing I do have that I, I greatly cherish is a video of the two of us talking the day before, I was on the Vatican delegation to the United Nations talk in, uh, conference on women in Beijing. And, uh, the Pope met all of us to kind of cheer us, cheer us on the day before we left for Beijing. So that is obviously something that um, meant so much to me. Now on a totally different topic, but certainly a big moment in my life and hopefully the Pope's, I think you know that I used to make chocolate chip cookies for the Holy Father. I had read in some magazine that John Paul loved chocolate. And uh, I'm a chocoholic, so I thought, why not make uh, brownies and chocolate chip cookies for a pope, and I, I did that for um, a number of years, and so now we all know that I made cookies for a saint, and that's the title of a book, by the way. And by the way, his secretary did uh, either call me or write a note every time I sent a new batch of cookies over. So now John Paul was this man, this pope, this holy father, whose entire life was like a multifaceted diamond. It was brilliant from every angle. His huge um, humor and sense of humanity, his love for mankind, for the church, for the priesthood, and of course his great love for, uh, for Mary. Now, my job at the Vatican Information Service and News Service was every day to write a summary of everything that the Pope said or wrote, all of his speeches and, and homilies. And I have to tell you, I can't tell you how much I learned about my faith, about the church over those years, and how my faith was, was deepened. And very often I would sit at my desk, I'd read some wonderful thing by Pope John Paul, and I'd have a thumbs up, and I'd say, way to go, Holy Father, thank you so much. And maybe, maybe he'd give me a new way of understanding something. So this multilingual, peripatetic pope with his charismatic persona, he really transformed the perception of the papacy from a very insular organization to one that became actively engaged in the world and became a very important voice on the um, international scene. And the papacy became relevant for far more than just Catholics, but for people of all faiths, and I have heard and read for people of, of no faith. 
And before this papacy, a pope was viewed as a very different figure, but there was no way that John Paul was going to be confined. As you know, he traveled a great deal and he brought the, the papacy and the church to the world. And I think what I most loved about his trips was watching him interact with or react to different cultures and traditions. And sometimes, you know, on a trip, just for a brief moment, he actually absorbed, he became part of that culture or tradition. So he was truly a man for all seasons. I, there's so, so much to say, but I do have to conclude, and I want to do that by saying how much Pope John Paul affected my prayer life. Um, I have always felt that I don't really know how to pray, and especially if I read prayers, the soaring prose of a psalmist or, or a saint or a pope, I just know that I can't pray like them. But I was privileged on a number of occasions to attend Mass in John Paul's private chapel. And as we entered, my feeling was always that he never sensed our presence because he was in the presence of the one that, that, that he loved. And, um, but I have to say, watching him pray, I'll probably not live long enough ever again to see anyone pray like this Pope did. And it, it was like almost mystical. I, I was imagining the conversations he was having with our Lord and certainly with his blessed mother whom he loved, um, you know, so profoundly. And, and I, I think watching him, this made me realize I am not a psalmist. I'm Joan. I'm a daughter of the Lord made in his image and likeness. And maybe my own gift is a different way of praying. Maybe it's, it's a childlike simplicity as I try to talk to, to maybe cry and maybe laugh with my best friend, and my best friend became Jesus because of John Paul. On that, back to you. Joan, thanks for that beautiful sharing. You share the sentiments of so many people who said, I saw the Lord in and through him. He says, the body, in fact, and only the body is capable of making visible the invisible, the spiritual and the divine. It has been created to transfer into the visible reality of the world, the mystery hidden from eternity in God, and thus to be a sign of it. Make visible the mm. invisible. That's not only his call, that's your call to be the face of Christ to others. God bless you and all of your loved ones. Keep it on EWTN. You're an important part of this family. You're never alone. You're always at home with Jim and Joy. Bye now.